Marilyn. Welcome everyone to uh, our EdNet forum. And this time uh, it's with Compassion It. And the founder uh, of Compassion It, Sarah, was I think probably the very first person I met when I started my job as the education director for the Charter for Compassion. Um, and we went out to lunch. She came up, uh, you were in Seattle, but you came over to Bainbridge Island. Um, and we started this, uh, what, what I hope is a really good relationship uh, with Sarah and all of the activities. And then um, more recently, because of another program that the charter uh, worked with, uh, Karen Gross's uh, conversation um, group, uh, I met Burl, who is now uh, a part of Compassionate. And so I'm going to let both of them introduce themselves and to tell us about Compassionate. And more importantly, how everyone who's watching this can take advantage of what they do. And um, most importantly, the reminders that are a part of Compassionate, the, the very bracelet, uh, and I think I've I've had this now for um, I don't know I, maybe eight years, uh, if not I, more, if yeah. not more. Yeah. Oh, so, nice, yeah. Nancy. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll get started. I have slides to to share if that's okay, and I can sure. show you what we're what we're in for over the next ninety ish minutes. Um. And it's really an honor to be here. So thank you for having us, Marilyn. I have so admired you and the charter for many years, and it's been great working together with you all over these past several years to create a more compassionate world. And Burrell has actually been a part of Compassionate since the very beginning. So we'll tell a little bit more about that story. But we're here to talk about our work specifically uh, in education because we've had the opportunity to do quite a bit in schools and with educators over the past 11 years that we've been doing this work. So we're, we're gonna start with an introduction to our organization and to us and to uh, the work that we have done in schools. And then we're gonna actually do a little bit of a workshop with you all. And I know that you all are compassion experts already, but we thought it might be fun to do some of the, the stuff that we do so that you can get a little bit of a taste of our work and we're going to talk about common humanity and why that's such an important part of compassion and we'll do an exercise with you that helps to illustrate that and then we'll of course invite you to go forth and compassionate and we'll be here to answer questions at that point at the end so before we start um we always want to make sure people know whether they're watching this recording or whether you're here today that you don't you have choice so if there's something that you don't feel comfortable doing, you don't have to. You can always opt out of what we're offering here. So we won't be offended. It's totally okay. That's a form of self-compassion, knowing how to take, take care of yourself. Um, but before we dive into our work and who we are, we would love to start with just a brief practice that helps us feel the feeling of compassion. So I'd like to invite you all to find a grounded posture. <sighs> and if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes or just cast your gaze down, unfocusing the eyes. And we can take a few deep breaths together to start. So exhaling everything out. <sighs> Inhaling through the nose, filling your lungs all the way up. And then exhaling. And once more inhaling. And exhaling. And now close the lips and just breathing in and out of the nostrils. Relaxing the forehead the eyes, the jaw, softening the shoulders and abdomen. 
And just coming into this peaceful experience of breathing. And now with your eyes still closed or your gaze down, I'd like for you to think back on a time that you experienced compassion. So maybe you noticed someone struggling and you helped them. Maybe you yourself were struggling and someone helped you. Or perhaps you witnessed it in front of you. You saw compassion unfolding. And see if you can put yourself back in that moment with as much detail as you can. Noticing where you are and who was there, what was happening, what you see and hear. And now tuning into what you feel. Where in the body are you feeling compassion and what does that feel like? What sensation or sensations are you noticing? And if it's helpful to ground that feeling of compassion with a hand on the heart, I invite you to do so. And now let's just take one more deep breath in and breath out feeling that feeling of compassion. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So anybody want to share what does compassion feel like? What did you notice? Not going into the story of your visualization. But what did that feel like? Feel soft. It felt soft. Beautiful. Warm. Maybe one more. A big hug. Ah, nice. It felt like a big hug. And that's a good feeling. Great. Great. Well, we are here today because we think we need more of that, that feeling in our world. And I would like to start by just backing up and briefly telling you about how Compassionate got started many, many years ago. This is back in 2008 when my daughter was just a year and a half old. And I'm smiling in this picture, but I was really going through a tough time. I was facing an unwanted divorce and I had quit my job to be home with her. And in 2008, there was you know, a huge economic disaster. So there were no jobs and I was really a mess and um, spent a lot of time crying and carrying on. And I happened to watch a lot of daytime television during that time too, because when children are that young, they nap a lot. And I happened on an Ellen episode that changed the trajectory of my life. I think she was interviewing Wayne Dyer, although the words that I heard are very similar to what um, Karen Armstrong says all the time. And it's that if we could teach all of our children compassion, we would solve every social problem in the world. Compassion is the most important lesson to teach our children. And I had never really thought about the power of compassion until that moment. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that very evening, uh, I had an idea. The word compassionate appeared in my mind as two words, as you all have seen, compassion it. And it looked just like this black and white. It was a very clear vision. I saw it as a bumper sticker. And I thought, well, that's kind of clever. It's like, just do it or Google it. This is uh, making compassion a verb. And so I got online right away to see, has somebody else thought of this already? And I saw nothing. And so I thought, well, I'll get the trademark for stickers. Maybe this can be like the next coexist and they'd be up you know, on cars all over. So I 
I started that process and then for three years I postponed that trademark um, because it took me around that that amount of time to get my life back on track and feel like myself again. And during that time, I began to compassionate in my life. And I realized, wow, this little phrase is really powerful. When I am compassionate at work, things go a lot more smoothly. When I compassionate with my daughter's father, that relationship went a lot better. When I compassioned it for myself, life was much sweeter. So I realized this, this very simple two word phrase really made an impact in my own life. And I had a sense of urgency to get it out there to others. So I started making stickers and that turned into t-shirts. And then that turned into, um, which Marilyn has already shown you these wristbands that you flip every time you compassion it. And so this was, this is back in 2012. We had uh, the wristbands, no website or anything. We had it on the Facebook page and Burrell can tell you about he and I met in, in a minute, but I was part of this program and, you know, I didn't know, is anybody going to buy these or want these, but we always sold them in pairs and the tag reads, wear one and share one. So we had these pairs of wristbands. Well, someone sent their extra wristband. I'm not going to show you the video, but to that woman and her name is Carrie Hope Fletcher. She happened to have a YouTube channel with hundreds of thousands of followers on it from all over the world. She did a little thing on her YouTube channel about her wristband and literally overnight, Compassionate became a global movement with teenagers all over the world purchasing our Compassionate wristbands. So that was, again, that was in the fall of 2012. And the wristband now is all over the world in, uh, gosh, more than 50 countries in all 50 states, from homes in Nepal to teens in Argentina to villages in Liberia, people are using these compassionate wristbands. And we have a self-compassion version as well um, to help remind themselves to make compassion a priority. And we've been so fortunate that the charter has helped us get even more of these wristbands out in the world. So we've seen wristbands on some famous wrists and some athletes over here on the left. That's the president of Botswana. In Botswana, they actually did a, a nationwide compassionate movement. They made wristbands in the colors of Botswana, blue and black. They brought me and a colleague over to teach compassion to, in the government hospitals. And it was really tremendous. They had they were selling them in the grocery stores. It was really pretty wild to see. Um, a nation try to take this whole movement on. And then Burrell and I had the opportunity to go to Rwanda a few years ago, I guess 2019, and we spent time at a refugee camp helping them unleash compassion in their healthcare system. So that was really an honor for us. So you're probably wondering, so you created wristbands and then you started teaching? How does that make any sense? Well, I was fortunate enough during this whole uh, wristband time, I got pretty obsessed with compassion and wanted to learn as much as I could. And I found out that Stanford had a center for compassion and altruism research and education. And they had developed an eight week course to help people cultivate compassion. It was called compassion cultivation training. And they were looking for teachers. So I was in the very first cohort to go through a year long training at Stanford to be trained to teach that course. And that was 11 years ago. Burrell also was trained just a year or two later. And so he and I have been teaching compassion ever since. So, so Compassion um, is a nonprofit organization and we've worked with different organizations and different populations around the world. Today we're, we're focusing a little more on schools. And so I wanted to just show a few pictures of, of how teachers have used or educators have used compassionate in schools. We've seen bulletin boards where they, they invite people to write, write out like what are compassionate acts that we've done or what are ways that I could compassion it. They've used the wristbands quite frequently. It's just a very simple way to remind your kids to make compassion, like I said, a priority. And what's cool about this is you can reward the students. Hey, you just compassioned it with your wristband. So that's a neat, simple way for an educator to point out acts of compassion that they see throughout the day, 
to reward those. Um, and it's it's just what's cool about the wristband and the phrase is a very simple concept that kindergartners can get. So we've had literally kindergarten classrooms, um, you know, all the way through seniors that I, t I teach at San Diego State University. So I have college students that also use the wristbands as well. Um, we've also, Burrell and I, because what we really care about is, is teaching. I mean, we care about all of it, but we love to facilitate programs. So we've been able to do quite a lot in schools for the educators themselves. So these, this is the high tech, high system in San Diego. I had the opportunity to do some, some development with them. And we often focus on self-compassion with educators because they have to learn how to take care of themselves, we found. Um, and then this past year, I published a book. I, I wrote and published a book called A Case for Compassion, What Happens When We Prioritize People and the Planet. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm, I'm looking at systems in this book and education is one of the systems that I examine. So the point of the book is to say like, here's where we are. Uh, not really very good. I bring in statistics and research and I interview, I interviewed folks for it. And then I say, here's an example of a school or a system that actually uses compassion and look at the outcome. And here are steps that we can take to get there. So I have a chapter focused on education, one on law enforcement, one on criminal um, corrections, one on the workplace, and one on healthcare. So it's an easy kind of, I think, easy read, but also I'm going to say profound. I think it's been really helpful for people who've read it to view the world from this compassionate lens. Um, so I'd like to stop sharing and now offer the floor to Burrell so that he can share his story of how he got involved with Compassion It and in this work. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, I met Sarah through the website um, that we both were a part of that brought random strangers on the internet <laughs> together to learn more about social entrepreneurship. Um, I had uh, just come home um, from um, the army uh, back to my neighborhood and I would have been safer on a battlefield than moving back home to uh, the neighborhood uh, that I'm from in Chicago, um, which is where the you know uh, moniker Chirac came from. Um, it was a response from people in the community who were looking at the statistics of uh, American lives being lost in Chicago versus American lives being lost in the literal uh, war. Um, in Chicago fared worse. Um, and uh, I found that unconscionable in, in coming back home. Um, so I was looking for ways to get involved uh, with, with, with my um, community. Um, and so I, I was very interested in social entrepreneurship and what are these ways that we can leverage um, ideas uh, that are used to organize business um, and take some of those ideas and apply it to the betterment um, of, of communities. And that's where I met Sarah. Uh, and she hit me with this ridiculous claim uh, that uh, compassion can change the world, that that feeling that you felt when you did the um, visualization, that that somehow has the power to make things better. Um, you know, Sarah's from San Diego, where apparently, you know, if it's uh, too sunny, people don't go to work. <laughs> but I'm from Chicago, where even if it's negative 50, you do go to work, okay? <laughs> um, so I'm like, okay, uh, this is cool. This is interesting. Um, uh, and the wristband is a really fantastic idea. Um, but... I need to see, I, I like, I, I'm working on real hit issues here in Chicago. Um, how does this get me uh, closer? And then I started to learn about what is compassion. Uh, and as Sarah went through the Stanford program first um, and recommended that I go through, um, and I was part of the second cohort <laughs> um, of uh, the C care at Stanford and the um, compassion cultivation trainer, uh, trainers. Um, and 
when I learned the depth and the richness of what compassion is and and how to make it a, a, a daily practice um, and this wonderful tool, <laughs> um, at Compassionate, it all made sense uh, about why um, that's important. Um, Sarah shared uh, that when she saw this um, and she was radicalized, if you will, by this idea of compassion, um, it was because if young people knew this, we would be able to solve our social problems. Um, and I had the opportunity and experience to see what happens when compassion is not um, a part of what people learn when they grow up. And I learned that uh, through, after having done workshops for years, I had an opportunity to do a compassion workshop in a jail. Um, and I've done this with elementary school kids, kindergartners, uh, everyone, um, companies, uh, uh, wherever you find people. Um, and I would ask in the workshop, what is compassion, right? Which is, a, it's, which is a fairly simple question. It's more complex, um, but usually people have some kind of responses to that. Um, kindness, being nice to each other, um, you know, love in, in these different kinds of things. Um, until I asked that question in a jail uh, and no one could answer. They genuinely wanted to answer, uh, but had no idea what is compassion. We don't know. We literally don't know. Um, and I was overcome with guilt, honestly, in that this is how we treat people in our society that we haven't even introduced to the idea and concept of compassion. Um, and how terrible that is, <laughs> uh, that this is that this is indeed the case. Um, and it became more apparent that it's absolutely important that we get this message out into the world. Um, and each and every day when we wake up, we should be getting this message out to the world in our personal lives by finding someone who needs our help and helping them. Um, and the wristband is a wonderful tool for reminding you uh, to make that a, a, a daily practice. Um, and then Sarah released her book, uh, which really goes into more um, some of the nuances around why these things are important and some of the institutions uh, that are critical uh, for making this a part of their operations. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, and I'll just say this one last thing, um, is that, you know, as individuals, we can make things happen, but together we make big things happen. Um, and the ideas that bring us together, compassion needs to be a part of that. Right? Just as destructive as it can be as individuals, not knowing what compassion and being in institutions like jails, when we're working together collectively, compassion needs to be a part of that conversation because if it's not, then we're probably gonna end up doing things that are criminal in nature. Um, if if compassion is not an important part of how we collaborate um, and how we exercise our energy together and what kind of outcomes are we looking for, um, that should be compassionate outcomes, right? <laughs> we, we're, we're constantly looking for that and that should be a cornerstone of our lives and Sarah was right. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't believe that this stuff was that important, but it truly, uh, it truly is, and that's why I'm here with you today. Thank you. Yeah, Burrell and I have had a lot of um, uh, shared a lot of experiences over the past many years, and and really the pandemic helped us discover that we can facilitate together a lot more. So now we, we used to do mostly, you know, things in person. He would focus in Chicago and I was more here. And now we do a lot of sessions over Zoom, which is wonderful because um, it's really fun to, to co-facilitate with him and, he, and hear his wisdom. So any questions about Compassion It before we move on to sort of the meat of, of what we're doing? I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, sessions that you facilitate online. Sure. Well, it depends on on the audience. So 
one thing that we haven't done a very good job of at Compassionate is find a target audience. And I'm sure the charter feels the same way. It's, you know, any marketer will say, you got to focus on the target audience. And we're like, but everybody needs this. So uh, really, it depends on who has reached out and who would like to um, learn from us. But we do either self-compassion workshops or com you know, creating compassionate cultures for organizations and educators online. And depending on how much time they give us and um, really what their needs are, we tailor our content to meet their needs. So some people have 90 minutes and that's it. Some folks have six months to devote to, you know, every other week or every week we can meet and and learn a new skill and revisit what we learned the week before. So it just depends on on the amount of resources that an organization has. And we are a nonprofit, so we'll, we'll, we'll work with any budget, um, which is great. We think that's very important, but it we don't have any sort of specific trainings. I mean, we, he and I both teach compassion cultivation training, which is a very specific eight week course. That was the one developed at Stanford, but um, everything else, mostly what we do is, is tailor the content for whoever has yeah, reached out. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't uh, continue with this and talk about, uh, for example, your, you both teach um, compassion cultivating, cultivation training. Um, how do you do that? You do it online also. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And can I ask what is the cost? The I think I don't know what you see right now. We're both teaching through UCSD's Center for Mindfulness, and oh. I think maybe they're charging a, a few hundred dollars, three or I want to say it's between three and four hundred dollars um, per student. So that's as you know. And then we as teachers get a, a portion. But. And then um, how long does it take online? So that is it every week for eight weeks or is there space mm -hmm. in between? Yeah. And are you talking two hours. two hours? Okay. Yeah, two hours a week uh, for eight weeks. Um, and, and that's CCT. Uh, we've also developed um, other curriculums because uh, one of the things that we notice is sometimes an inaccessibility of compassion. Um, and particularly when you're talking about an institution like Stanford, uh, whom I have all the love in the world for. Um, but when when I was a you know CCT teacher, I wouldn't have been able to make it there without Sarah right. and some of the senior staff kind of advocating for me and making it possible for me to participate. Um, you know, I'm very open uh, that, you know, when I was there, um, 10 years ago, <laughs> you know, I was the youngest, blackest person there, right? <laughs> um, and definitely the poorest person. I like, I struggled to, to, to make that happen. Um, so there is an air of exclusivity to that, um, that it's really hard when you're a prestigious institution to separate, you know, you can't, you don't realize that you're being prestigious, even when you're trying not to be, right? Um, <laughs> So it's just like you can't it, like it's just how it is um but we try to make compassion accessible i think that's a really important component of the compassionate mission which is why you have something like a wristband um like you know you probably wouldn't have been able to come up with that at stanford because you're just like what's a wristband gonna do i was in that position where it's like what's a wristband gonna do <laughs> you realize that like oh no this is something that is really really powerful um, and insidious even <laughs> uh, for bringing compassion in, uh, to the fore of, of, of people's lives. So we have different curriculums like compassion training for busy people that we've done, um, which is a five week course. And it's, you know, one hour, um, 90 minutes optional uh, kind of a, a gathering of people to really get, you know, here are some of the, the, the tidbits um of, of compassion or we'll work with an organization if they wanted to bring us in exclusively for their audience to find out to find something that works for them even if it's a day long or two day uh kind of a workshop type thing okay we need to talk oh we'd love to good well carry That's on great
Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll talk later. Uh, wonderful. Any other questions before I move on? We'll have time, hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end too. And you can of course just chime in if you have questions as we're working through this, this stuff. Borella, I will say another thing, Borella and I, um, you know, we're not perfect. We, we are, I like to kind of say greedy. We're greedy because we want everyone to know everything. And so we really fill our, if we have 90 minutes, we're going to go 90 minutes and we want you to know everything we know. And it's hard to share everything in 90 minutes, but we're very ambitious with our, with our workshops, which isn't always the best thing, but we, we, what is it that we call it? It's like rapid compassion. Yeah, I think we've deemed it perhaps <laughs> rapid compassion. Uh, so this word compassion, uh, what, what is compassion? So Burrell, did you want to share anything in the, the chat or do you want me to just keep? Uh, no, no, let's move on. Okay, so little known fact at its Latin roots, compassion means to suffer with. So when we are compassionate, we are not running away from suffering. We're not pretending we don't see it. We also are not getting overwhelmed by it. We are able to stay present in the midst of suffering. So that lead, leads me to this question, well, what is suffering? In our culture, the word suffering um, indicates typically something really horrible, like you can obviously see me bleeding and there, therefore I'm suffering. But it's important that you understand that in our world, we're using a very expansive definition of suffering. So our teachers taught us that suffering is whenever, whenever you, there's a gap between where you are and where you want to be. So if you want something you can't get, or you get something you don't want, you're suffering. Raise your hand if you've ever wanted something that you can't get or gotten something you don't want. Anybody? Most of us feel this way most of the time, unfortunately. The good news is uh, most of us feel this way most of the time. The bad news is most of us feel this way most of the time. Why is that good? It's because that means every single person you encounter is someone you can offer your compassion to. Because you're not going to know from their faces what's going on inside, but you can bet that they're worried about something. Right? So it, it is important that we understand what, what we're saying when we talk about the word suffering. It's this expansive definition. So the definition that we often use for compassion is what we learned at Stanford, that it's a cascade of events that begins with noticing suffering, which makes sense, right? You can't be compassionate if you first don't see the suffering in front of you. Uh, then you feel, and this is the empathy, sometimes people confuse empathy and compassion. Empathy uh, is what you feel when you see someone suffering. Sometimes that happens automatically. That's visceral empathy. We have mirror neurons that allow us to feel what others feel. So if you all see me slam the door on my big toe and it rips off the toenail, that would hurt, right? That You could maybe feel pain. Yeah, you can feel it now, right? That's painful. Uh, that's our body's ways of connecting us to each other. But sometimes you have to use your brain power and say, what might it be like to be that person, right? That's another way of getting at empathy. You can get to it cognitively or viscerally, but empathy stops there. With compassion, there's more because after you feel, then there's this desire to help that bubbles up. This is innate within us. We want to help people who we notice are struggling. And then with compassion, there's this willingness to do something about it. We want to alleviate that suffering and we want to take action. Maybe we can't do anything in the moment, but we do have a willingness and, and that willingness can inspire us to take action later or to have the wisdom um, to pause and get the, the resources that are needed to take the right action. Um, what's cool about compassion is that the byproduct of it is this warm glow that hopefully you all felt in the beginning of the session. So compassion feels good. It energizes. 
us. It gives us all those feel good hormones um, like oxytocin. And that's why we say there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. Uh, it's actually empathic distress or empathy fatigue because neuroscience shows us compassion actually gives us energy and makes us feel good. Okay, so if you're if you're doing compassion well or right, it means that it, you're going to keep feeling good. So there are a few points about compassion that we want to just make sure we reiterate. Again, suffering is expansive. Everyone suffers. And then this part is important too. Mindfulness is something we, we talk about a lot and teach in our courses because you, if you're not present, you're not gonna notice suffering, right? If you have your head buried in your phone or your mind is just wandering all the time, you aren't gonna feel your own suffering and you're not gonna notice the suffering of others around you. So you have to cultivate mindfulness in order for the cascade of compassion to begin. And on that note, Burrell is actually gonna guide us through a mindfulness exercise now to help us come even more present than we are. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and to whomever is watching this, right, you can participate um, in this as well. Uh, I really like this uh, mindfulness exercise um, because it tunes into some of the other senses. Um, because it's important to build present moment awareness um, in order to exercise compassion, right? Like if you're going to recognize suffering, you need to be able to see it. Um, and you can't see it if you're too busy. Uh, so if you think of a time where maybe you were running late for something, um, think about what how you drive when you're running late <laughs> or, you know, how you walk about or, you know, tootle about, run, however you <laughs> um, overcome this idea that I need to be somewhere else. I cannot be in the now. I need to be somewhere else very soon. You're not thinking about the people around you. You're not being considerate. You're not being mindful. You're not being compassionate. <laughs> um, chances are um, if you're trying to be somewhere else, if you're not in the present moment. Uh, so building present moment awareness um, is a very powerful tool for furthering uh, your ability to exercise compassion. Um, with 54321, you can do this anytime, anywhere. Um, so, you know, let's do it. So let's start with the with the with the number uh, five. But before we do that, let's take a deep breath in together. In through the nose and out through the mouth. Now, maybe we're in places that have become very familiar over the last few years, uh, but take a moment to try to notice five things around you. So tune in into your eyes and take a moment to rest your gaze on five different objects around you. Maybe it's something that you didn't notice or haven't noticed in a while, and you just want to take a moment to appreciate it, right? Let your eyes gaze on this object, pay attention to its form, its shape, its color. What is this object? Right. Take a moment to appreciate it and try to notice five different objects around you right now in this moment. What are five things around you right now. Now, if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or simply lower your gaze. But now let's tune into the sense of sound and try to notice four different things that you can hear around you right now. Whether it's my voice coming through the screen or some kind of very subtle noise that may be coming from our computers. Are there things going on outside? What are four different things that you can hear right now? What is that sound? How loud is it? Is it near? Is it far? 
what are four things that you can hear right now in this moment? Now let's tune in to our sense of touch. What are three things that you can physically feel right now in this moment? Whether it's temperature or some people can feel the pressure in places. What are three things that you can physically feel right now. Now this one may be a little bit more challenging. Um, humans have a lot of amazing talents and skills that nature has bestowed on us. Smell is not really one of them. But see if you can notice two different smells around you right now. What are two things that you can smell right now in this moment? And finally, digging really deep for this one, in this moment, what is one thing that you are grateful for? What is one thing that inspires gratitude for you right now in this moment? Take a moment to think of that and take a moment to notice how it makes you feel. is one thing you are grateful for. All right, and when you're ready, you can come back to the space. I really love this activity because you can do it anytime. However, if you are driving, do not close your eyes and participate in this activity. I said that, so the lawyers know that I said that. Do not close your eyes and do that activity while driving. Thank you. Any any observations from that exercise? It made me feel different. So now I notice my body. I feel more present now. It's really nice. I feel very grateful that you led us into that exercise with the material that you presented prior to it because when we got to number one all I could feel was gratitude for getting to be a part of this right now so mm -hmm. thank you for framing it in that way that was really beneficial for me thank you and I think whatever um, you're concentrating on it becomes more intensified when you do it this way. So I, you know, when you were talking about what are you feeling? And I thought, my nose is cold. And then as I kept concentrating <laughs> on that, I thought, my God, my nose is a nice field. You know, it's, it's got so <laughs> many. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's important to notice things like that um, because you should do something about that, right? Your nose is... <laughs> hey, look, time to put on the heat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. What's uh, People often think mindfulness and meditation are the same thing, and they don't realize you don't have to meditate to exercise or practice mindfulness. You can just tune into your senses, and that's a much more accessible way for you to to come to the present moment. So, in, in schools, we also talk to teachers and educators and um, things uh, about 
Um, you know, present moment awareness comes in a lot of different ways. Sometimes you can do stuff with your hands, um, knitting, crocheting, uh, drawing, you know, or coloring, particularly. I think coloring um, is, is one of those things that's really helpful. So you can bring these kinds of tools in the classroom, um, you know, uncontroversially. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, in ways that are accessible to a lot of different um, uh, uh, people. I mean, we do recommend uh, breath-focused meditation and, and meditation as um, a component for building your capacity for compassion, um, but there are a lot of different avenues into, into that where people can start uh, and places where people can start because compassion truly is accessible to everybody. Yeah, we're, we're all born with it. Oh, go ahead, Marge. Yeah, just um, the question I've been asking myself a lot is like, how do I get myself to stop and do this? Like, I just, I feel like I'm often running, doing one thing and I need to slow down. I need to slow down. It's a message I keep getting, but I keep not slowing down. And, and I, I wish I had, you know, I've developed some good habits to start the morning, but, um, you know, after nine o'clock, I sort of like, mm, you know, it's I'm on autopilot. And I haven't built in good habits for stopping to be compassionate. Like I, I mentioned my friend Sarah, and I'm almost envious that as being a practicing Muslim, she stops five times a day to do prayers. And I, thought, I wish I did that. Um, you know, it's like, anyways, that that's my. I don't know if you've got a solution to that, but that is my dilemma at this point in time. I'm. Yeah. Do you use a calendar at all or or how do you know what to do throughout your day? Yeah, I do use a calendar, but I, um, you know, I put in things like going swimming and uh, set whatever. And I don't, you know, oh, I'm too busy. I ignore it. So if I can, I, I haven't been able to, mm -hmm. I don't think that would be a way of, I don't know. So, so and I'll yeah. say this purpose that I'm not advertising. But get a compassion wristband and wear it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I, I, I say that, um, and like I truly mean it because there's a couple things that happens with a compassion wristband. One, it's a it's a physical reminder to you, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that compassion is something that you want to make time for or care about. But it also reminds people around you. So people people will ask you about this wristband or, right, you'll talk about this wristband and no one asks you. Uh, but this builds a community. You start to become the compassion person. People are like, oh, Marge, Marge like, is into compassion. And they'll ask you about it or they'll remind you about it. Um, hopefully they remind you about it in situations where you're being very compassionate. And they're like, ah. Let me reaffirm that. Or they're reminding you in situations where they're like, oh, you know, there's a wristband that you're wearing talking about compassion. Are you being very compassionate right now, Marge? Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to the practice of present moment of awareness, there are different opportunities. You just have to be present, right? Are you paying attention to what's going on right now? Um, and I think the pandemic has created a really good opportunity for people to practice this in washing your hands. When you wash your hands, hopefully you wash your hands more now than you did you know, before. Um, and washing your hands and being reminded to like, let me do this practice mindfully. Um, and not mindfully of like, you know, making sure that you're doing the proper scrubs of your fingernails on the palm of your hand, right? Um, you're not getting ready for surgery. Just just focus in on the physical sensations of that it is such a glorious experience washing your hands if you pay attention to it the the the, the temperature of the water uh, uh there's water running over your hands there's soap and there are actions in your hands that are going on that and you have a lot of nerve endings in your hands um so it's really easy to tune into that experience of washing your hands that's a good way to bring mindfulness into your, into your, every time you wash your hands, try to notice what that feels like. Um, and 
trust me, like it, you, you will be present for a few moments in your day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something that's, that's important. Like you can, you, you, sh you should be able to fold that into uh, your, your, your normal actions and activities. And I encourage you to find those opportunities. What do you already do? And can you just be present when you do it? Um, it before you try to figure out other ways of being able to include it. Thank you. I will start with the washing hands and uh, we'll see where, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I also experience. recommend, you know, warm water and hand yep. washing feels good. I was going to say um, something that Brella and I do for our CCT classes is we pair people up with an accountability buddy for their medit because meditation is part of the course and it's that's a tough habit to get started. So if we have them text each other every time they meditate, and um, I've had an accountability buddy ever since I started two buddies ever since I started my teacher training program at Stanford. So it's been over 11 years that these two women and I nearly daily are hearing from each other after we do any type of meditation practice. So if there's somebody in your life that you could say, hey, this is something I care about. You care if I text you every time I I pause and you know take a, a breath or whatever it is that you're you're trying to um, hold yourself accountable to, it's it's helpful to have someone else along that journey or support you. So throwing that out there. Okay. Any other questions or observations before we move on? Well, I, just an, an additional, um, I think, tool. I remember going through a day timer training a long time ago. And one of the things that they recommended was that you um, you have your principles or your set of values that you start each day um, with reading them, and you know mm -hmm. if you if you do that and if you put uh, meditation in there, then eventually you'll get tired of reading it if you don't do something about it. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thank you for leading that exercise, Brell. It's always a favorite. Um, another point about compassion, which I already made, but just that empathy and compassion are not the same. And that warm glow is energizing. Compassion feels good and doesn't drain you. And then the fifth point about compassion, and the reason I have a bicycle here as the graphic, is because you need both. You need self-compassion at the same time that you are practicing compassion for someone else. So um, I've been through Roshi Joan Halifax's grace training, and she is very good about talking about how you have to be attuned to your own self while you're attuned to the other. So you can't just ignore what your body is doing in order to be compassionate to others. You have to be able to notice what's happening within me so that I can continue to resource myself in order to show up for others. So self-compassion is vital if you want to be able to practice compassion and, and continue to get that warm glow, okay? So, all right, any questions about compassion or suffering? This isn't okay, a question. so let's, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Yep. That, this isn't a question so much as an observation based on some of the things you've shared already. And that is um, suffering is sometimes very visible. Um, and in my mind, I'm recognizing the correlation between suffering and disability. A part of that is because I was recently at the Ontario airport where they have um, a movement that I hadn't seen before about invisible disabilities. The sunflower, I don't know if anybody else has seen this or not, but those who I, just, I was just introduced to it in passing through the airport, so I don't know much about it yet, but the sunflower can be a symbol to say, I, I have a disability that you can't see. And it occurs to me that so much suffering is invisible and we can't see it. 
and just the correlation between suffering and our ability to thrive seems fairly profound to me at this moment in conjunction with the exercise Burrell just took us through. And at the end of it, Burrell, when you mentioned um, giving people colors, crayons, I just am feeling like this thought of the colors of our suffering and how they range um, across the spectrum. And, um, and I don't know more about it than that, but that's just what's what's coming up for me right now is that there's something that we can use as a tool maybe that helps us um, recognize the suffering that isn't so visible and then use our skills and abilities as we develop uh, a stronger sense of being able to compassion it going forward. So that that's all. that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you, Marilyn, for putting a link in the chat. Incredible. I don't know how we missed this. It's all over the world. Yeah. I, uh, Wonderful. I, I, so Wonderful. I, I'll check that there's out. There's a group, group I, I work with, um, the fibromyalgia group that I post their events, and their emblem is a sunflower. And I never realized, I just... That's why they have their logo being a sunflower because fibromyalgia, of course, is that is an invisible one. But anyways, it was just a ah oh, a ha ha moment. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, really, really lovely. And and something that we can do as people who care about compassion is we can model what it's like to be vulnerable with others. That's something that. Uh, we can't see suffering, right? So oftentimes we have to let someone know, hey, I'm in a hard time right now, I need support. And by us modeling that for others, that shows the people that we care about in our lives that they can do that with us too. So, you know, we, that's an imp important part about compassion is, is this vulnerability piece, right? Being able to let folks know that you're struggling. And in our society, we really tell people that that's allowed. So. How would we, so we couldn't model it, but some people really do not want to feel suffering, that they are suffering or that that doesn't exist. Is there a way to, to get to them? Or do we just leave them alone? Or do we, maybe they're harming others? And how can we, is there a way of dealing with that? My, I'll, I'll go first and then Braille, maybe you have an answer, but I, I always lean toward I, um, modeling is the best is the best way to reach people by practicing with myself. I know that I can inspire others uh, to be this way. And then you can just compassion the heck out of them, right? You know, they're suffering. So, you know, offer your compassion. You don't need to know why and you don't need to expect that in return. That's an important part of compassion too, is not expecting a, a specific outcome or not expecting reciprocation. Um, so, you know, just we, we, I'm in control of me and that's yeah. it. So my hope is that I can inspire others to, to want to be more compassionate just because of what they're seeing and witnessing. So another of the responses well, I found is like, I know already, I know all that. And it's like, you know that they don't know and it's like what do I do I really want to be there with them or for them yeah and you know um one of the things about uh the journey you know through compassion and to becoming a more compassionate person uh, I think it's important to um you know develop a sense of there are a lot of people who would love our compassion and would be happy to accept our compassion. Find them and give it to them. Uh, because I think a lot of people who try to sideline the conversation of compassion or who you know might even come out in opposition to compassionate practices, um, they're really good at demanding our attention 
and we give it to them every time, <laughs> right? They're like, ah, oh, you're the person I need to pay attention to, the person who doesn't value compassion. When we're surrounded by people who do value compassion and we don't give them the attention because we're so focused on who doesn't <laughs> like compassion. Um, and it, it's just important to remember, you know, there are people who are really open uh, to this message and who are looking for this message and we need to find them and deliver that message. Yeah, I was just thinking about the modeling part. Um, you know, we so often just somebody says, how are you? And your instant response is, oh, I'm great. How are you? Um, but, you know, what happens if you let them know how you really are? And I had a teacher um, in Chicago when I was a principal, and um, he would always have a little name tag um, for every day he would put his feeling on his lapel. And so you didn't have to ask him how he felt because it was there. Uh, leave me alone. I'm grumpy. I <laughs> a conversation, you know, so that, you know, if you model something like that, the other thing I think is questions uh, that sometimes that reflect your willingness uh, to, you know, to really engage with people. Um, so how can I help you, you know, might be, uh, I, it's always a question that, you know, is somewhere in my head. I don't always use it, but it's there. That's lovely. lovely. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Burrell, do you think we have time for the exercise? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Okay. I mean, we've been talking through, okay. so that seems to be on Okay, so we are um, assuming, can we do breakout rooms, Merida? Are we gonna be able to put people with a partner? We will, okay. So uh, Burrell and I uh, love to do this exercise to illustrate the power of common humanity. So this notion that we are not alone and that just like me, everyone else suffers. Right. And um, this is a, an important element to compassion, because when we recognize that everyone is just like me, it's much easier for my heart to open to them with compassion. Right. So this is something that we can cultivate. Our brains are very good at saying, oh, I'm going to have compassion for people just like me. That's easy. That's going to happen automatically. But we can also train ourselves to say everybody is just like me. Everybody deserves compassion. So we're gonna put you um, with a partner and with your partner in your breakout room, you're going to, we're gonna give you two minutes per person to just share briefly something that's worrying you right now. And it's only two minutes and we don't have, you know, time afterward to be therapists or anything. So just know that as you're getting ready to share that there's not a lot of time for we're really exploring it. So share what you feel comfortable sharing. But as one person is sharing, the other person just listens without saying a word. You're just listening. There's no advice. There's nothing. And then we'll tell you it's time to switch. And then that other person will share. And then we're going to bring you back into the room. And we'll be guiding you through a practice while you're together here in the Zoom room. And when you come back, please be quiet. And it's helpful if you pin your partner on the screen. Does everybody know what I mean by that? So if you hover on the hover on someone else's picture, you see three dots, and you can hit the word pin, and then it just shows them bigger on the screen. And if okay. you're on your phone, so, double tap the screen, and it'll pin that person. Yep. So then that. Um, You'll pin your partner so that you're just looking at them. Okay, that's it, right, Barack? Shall I pause the recording for the in the meantime? Yes. Uh, probably. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. Okay. Great. Thank you. Exercise. And knowing that, please don't share what your partner shared in the room too. But any any observations? difficult not to want to respond 
to what was said. Like you really had to, you know, you really wanted to, yeah, yeah. And uh, just, it, it's, it's not easy just to sit and listen. Mm -hmm. That is something that always stands out for people is we realize what kind of listener we are when we're forced to stay quiet. So um, it's nice to give people space to share without interrupting with anything. Now, I'm especially anything grateful else? for the reminder of our common humanity and mm -hmm. that going from our partner to this small group and expanding beyond that into the virtual invitation to any human being into our lives. And um, there are certainly things that we all share that we don't necessarily articulate. What about when I said uh, that that way that you felt like you could connect to your partner that you would feel that way with any random stranger? that was here. Did that seem true for you? And we've done this enough times to to feel very confident that that's pretty true. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty true. And so accepting our own vulnerability and the vulnerability of the others. And there's a certain kind of, there's a connection that makes us strong somehow. No, it it we're together. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I um I really like the point that you brought up about um just being able to replace that person with someone randomly from the street. It's like it's so true. Yeah, you can really connect with somebody on that deeper level that you don't even know anything about. Mm -hmm. as so true yeah I, yeah I think this exercise is the key to world peace I'm convinced if we could just get all eight or nine billion of us on here on zoom together to do this practice all the problems would be solved so Marilyn if you want to make that happen then uh <laughs> okay, next Thursday we'll start earlier <laughs> what? Oh my God! <laughs> you know, I, I I missed this meeting today. Yeah, that's not fair to John. <laughs> I know, you know, John. Yeah, I'm kidding. I can I'll get up earlier if I if I was putting it on my schedule. I didn't. <laughs> well, but I'm glad I'm here now. It it's interesting because uh, we did a variation of this uh, exercise when the Dalai Lama. Um, uh, launched the C program, C learning program. And so we had a hundred people uh, in the room mm. who, who did this and we moved um, around. Uh, so we did it over and over and over again. So we had an opportunity, oh. uh, you know, to, to do this with multiple people. Uh, this has been really great. Um, I think that not only did it energize us, um, those of us who are here and hopefully those who see this, uh, but I think you've given us a whole lot of ideas and hopefully uh, a way to, uh, you know, reconnect at a, a much deeper level. So thank you both very much. Oh gosh, well, thank you for having us. It's really our pleasure. We love getting to, to share this work. As you all know, you've all caught the compassion bug too. So once you catch it, you, you just wanna do this all the time. So yeah. please do keep in touch. You can see our email addresses and um, you know, we'd love to hear from you if, if there's anything we can do to support you. And Marilyn, we look forward to, to chatting soon, I hope. Yeah, no, no, very soon. Uh, but I want to just let people know that uh, Sarah will be part of the Global Read in 2024. Uh, I think tentatively mm. we've looked at October, if that, uh, if we can work out a, a, a date. So we're all set for that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's been lovely. Really, really lovely, both of you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.
fun. It was incredible. Thank and you. the time passed so quickly. Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I wanted I'll another half hour. Fun. <laughs> right, right. I'll be reaching out to you as I'm I'm teaching my first um, intro to compassion course in the spring semester at a college here. And uh, I would like to uh, offer break the wristbands for all of my students um, as a part of the introduction. And then Sarah, I'll, I'll order your book too and see if I can um, mm -hmm. incorporate that into the, um, the learning. Uh, I'm excited to be able to uh, help share some of these tactics for um, becoming more compassion aware and then compassioning it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Really thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Have a lovely rest of your thank day. You. Have great days, everybody. See some right. of you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>